My name is Rainer Heufers. I'm with the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. Talking to you about Indonesia, I spent 15 years as a China researcher before, and that was in the 1980s and 90s, and there was this book that some of you may know from Lester Brown, Who Can Feed China? Saying if the Chinese ever grow wealthy, basically world food supplies will collapse and it will not be enough and there will be all kind of wars. So these kind of Malthusian ideas were very strong then and some are very strong still now. And China is changing its food self-sufficiency policy. It's very encouraging for us in Indonesia because Indonesia is still sticking to its food self-sufficiency policy. Um, so that is some paradigm that you find in the Indonesian policy. Uh, on the other hand, um, you have the short-lived interests and things changing with a tweet, etc. All of that we also have in Indonesia, and that makes Indonesian policies often very unpredictable. So we get mixed signals from the country. Um, on the one hand, what you get is a clear commitment to open trade uh, by the president, by the government. So currently there are negotiations with Australia about a common economic partnership, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, the same with the European Union. Things aren't fast, um, things aren't really moving in many respects, but nevertheless there seems to be a commitment. Uh, so while you get all these encouraging news, you then have other signals coming from Jakarta which sound much more protectionist, much more nationalist. We had the famous cases in the mining business when Freeport was forced recently, last year, to divest um, because Indonesia wanted the majority shareholdership. So we have mixed signals and a lot of people are confused to what's happening and I guess that's why I was invited to shed a little bit of light on why is this happening and what is behind this. And of course, I want to focus mostly on food. Food is the uh, big topic here and in particular food trade and that is something that our center in Jakarta is actually dealing with quite extensively. Here are four factors that matter and that always need to be taken into consideration when you look at food trade issues in Indonesia. <clears throat> First of all, you have a nationalist impulse. It's there. You can talk to anybody in the country. They would say, we'd rather eat our own food. Food safety, unfortunately, is not yet such an issue like it is in the European Union. But the food should be grown in our country. Really, that any taxi driver you, you, you talk to in the country, anybody else, they would share that with you. They haven't thought about it much. They just believe it's better to eat your own food. Um, then there is the lack of coordination in the government, uh, so not planning isn't really the strongest forte of Indonesian policymakers, so lack of coordination is something that needs to be taken into consideration. And then there are the vested interests that are quite powerful. So these three things always matter. I wish I was able to say this is 20%, this is 30%, this is the remaining 50% in this equation, that's not possible. But all three factors matter. While there is still a need to trade internationally. Food self-sufficiency is a myth. It's not going to happen. Uh, China is changing its policy. In Indonesia, it's also clear every year the country needs to import besides all the rhetoric. So that's what I'm going to talk about in particular. So the nationalist impulse, the first um, factor that I mentioned just now. That's the food self-sufficiency policy. We could spend an entire day talking about why is this the case. There may be the colonialism that comes into the play here, hundreds of years of being ruled by other people. There's a strong feeling we should be autonomous, we should be independent, and food should come from our own soil. So that, that's basically as much as I can say about this, where it's coming from. What it looks like in the end is lots and lots of restrictions, too many as I would be able to explain right now. In several laws, it would state that food needs to be uh, grown first in the country and it's only allowed to be imported once domestic supplies are not sufficient. Then you have specific regulations like the one that I'm showing you right now that says imported beef is not allowed to enter traditional markets, which are the most important markets, obviously. With the result, because imported beef can be much cheaper than domestic, that you find stalls that actually defreeze the imported beef, sprinkle some fresh blood on it and sell it as domestic beef. And then you get the newspapers that report about it. So, you know, you can make a lot of regulations, doesn't mean people actually stick to them. Um, but this is just one example. There are so many others in the area of uh, beef, rice, corn, maize, corn, soy, you, you name it. Beef, obviously, is for Australia of particular importance. Very annoyed, many Indonesian farmers very annoyed by this new rule, relatively new rule, 
I spoke to some pastoralists and graziers in Western Australia about this, that for every five uh, feeder animals that you want to sell to the country in Indonesia, you have to sell one breeder. That's a new rule. That's extremely difficult to comply with because right now the export of uh, breeder ca ca uh, cattle to Indonesia is rather low, so that would have been increased a lot if Australian exporters wanted to comply with this rule, so they're quite puzzled how to actually do this. Um, I can assure you, uh, nobody has an answer for this, uh, neither me, but I can assure you this is nothing just to hit Australia. This is the way of policy making in Indonesia. You want to, um, when you have to import something, you still at least want to make sure some producers in the country still benefit from this. It's an impulse. Uh, this is not thought through. There is no long-term plan behind this. But the same kind of policy making affects lots of other products and lots of other exporters. For example, the, uh, the tobacco industry is hit by the same thing because 20% of uh, tobacco has to be sourced domestically if you want to produce cigarettes in the country. Well, if there is no tobacco of sufficient quality, they really have a problem how to do this unless they want to buy it and then not use it. Same in the smartphone markets, 30% local content regulation. If you can't get content of the required quality, how do you do this? So this is not just in food and agriculture. This is anywhere. It's an impulse by policymakers. It's often ad hoc very fast, not thought through, but nevertheless, it's a rule and everybody else puzzles how to implement it. Now that all sounds very gloomy, it's very negative in a way. There's also some good news here. Um, if you look at this chart here where you see the state interventions in Indonesia that affect Australia in particular, um, you see that there was a peak uh, in the years 2012 until 2014. That was basically the end of the period of the last president, uh, Yudo Yono. Um, when he had his second term, at the end, he became quite protectionist. There were lots of protectionist uh, policies that were put into effect. That changed with the new president. You see there are still discriminatory measures, but the number has at least reduced. So it's not just all going up and getting worse. This was worse in the past, and the current president is actually doing uh, less of that stuff than the predecessor. All of it, the most harmful ones, as you see on the right, um, affect beef when it comes to Australia. So um, that's quite clear how that hurts the export um, um, desires here in the country. So this is all about this nationalist impulse. But on the other hand, you have the other factor that must always be taken into consideration. There is not a huge nationalist conspiracy Quite often, it's just a lack of coordination. One ministry doesn't know what the other one does, and you have a lot of agencies and ministries involved. You can't read all of this, doesn't matter. It's the Ministry of Agriculture, Trade, agencies of various sorts. They all make their own regulations. They're all headed by some politically connected person who has a political agenda as well, and <clears throat> you end up with egoisms on different sides, and they are not coordinated, and so the companies struggle with this a mash of different interests and don't know how to deal with it. What happens in the end is that you end up with licensing processes because imports are needed that take a long time. We just made this chart there. It takes about 32 days just to get this import license. <clears throat> and you see how many agencies are involved. The Ministry of Agriculture has to make a recommendation. They are very protectionist in the Ministry of Agriculture. So they will only give you that recommendation if they really believe it's absolutely necessary. And then still you have to go to the Ministry of Trade um, to actually get your approval for that. All this takes you a month. Now we calculated, don't look at all the numbers, just the column on the right. We looked at the world market prices. If Indonesia in the last eight years had always imported a month earlier than it actually did, it would have saved 303 billion rupiah, which is about 20 million US dollars. So this, this licensing process that takes so long is actually very costly for the country because you always miss the moment when the prices are low and you're buying at a time when the prices are higher. Or right now, Indonesia has decided to import rice, but this decision took so long that now this actual import happens during the harvest season and really affects the farmers. So, um, all of this comes with tremendous consequences. Um, the president is aware of this. He has just um, 
announced that he has a new chief of staff. He has uh, asked the previous one to leave. He was a great man, but much of a thinker. Now we have a former general, the head of the military actually, to uh, become his chief of staff. And this man was responsible to actually help getting the decision done that rice is being imported and the bureaucracy was too slow. So the president wants more of his decisions to actually be implemented and wants more resolve in this. So we have these two factors, the nationalist impulse, the lack of coordination. Both matter a lot. And thirdly, power vested interests. I can't spend too much time on this. Most of it is anecdotal that I could share with you. Hor horrible stories, unfortunately. Um, Whenever it hits the courts, then it becomes official and then we can talk about it. On the left-hand side, this is the famous beef gate from a couple of years ago, when the Islamist party that, that ran the Ministry of Agriculture for the longest time um, was accused of actually um, giving special import licenses to firms that were close to the Islamist party. The former party chairman was jailed for 16 years for that. And on the right-hand side, that was just last year, the Constitutional Court judge, Patrialis Akbar, was sentenced to eight years because he took money and let that influence his decision, again, on import beef licenses. So um, two cases that demonstrate big money is being made in the area of, of importing, and this money goes to vested interests to, to influence the licensing process. <clears throat> but not only politicians and court judges, etc., are in this. The army plays also a large role. The army has always wanted to play a big role in the country's domestic policies. They were, after Soharto, they were pushed more to the national defense, border defense. But now they are involved in food security. So now they have said, okay, if we don't produce enough food, we don't have food self-sufficiency, they have commissioned 50,000 troops to be stationed in the fields to help the villagers um, grow more rice as if a military soldier would really be the right person to do this. But they are there and they use this to say we are in charge of human security, that includes food security, we have a domestic role to play. That is important in the power equation of the country. So these are the four main factors that I wanted to talk to you about. They all matter in the country and this comes <coughs> with tremendous consequences. Sorry, I also of course the need to trade internationally. Just two quick graphs. The agriculture minister was very proud to say we almost reached food self-sufficiency in rice. You see the blue bars, that is the actual rice production. Every year is growing, so looks good. But then you look at the line in front of the blue bars, that is the food imports. Every year the country is basically importing rice. It's still just not enough. And beef, you see on the right-hand side, the dark orange one, that's the actual imports. You see in 15, 2014, 15, 16, 17, in 15 it was relatively low, 16 and 17 beef imports grew. Um, uh, the total number for 2017 is not yet the full year, that's why the, the full bar is relatively low. But you see imports already, they have been growing in the last couple of years. Imports are a reality, are a necessity, food self-sufficiency does not exist. <clears throat> um, now let's talk about the consequences. Uh, the consequences are dire, because with this import restrictions and all these regulatory barriers, the Indonesians are paying the price. And that's why we're addressing this in our center. The Indonesians are paying the price. The OECD has calculated that Indonesians have been taxed in three years from 2013 to 15, almost $100 billion, because the price is taxed, because the price has basically went up for domestic food because of these trade restrictions. In the year 2015 alone, it is more than 30 billion US dollars. And that year, according to the same calculation in the European Union, the cap uh, uh, policy framework um, only taxed the Europeans by 22 billion dollars. So the Indonesians actually pay much more for their own protectionism. Um, and that are, is a dire consequence in a country where people are vulnerable to poverty. Look at the beef prices. The orange line is the international markets. The blue line is the domestic prices in Indonesia. They are, in real terms, way above uh, the international markets. The same is in the rice price. You see the global rice price is relatively stable. That's the blue line. The international rice price, uh, the domestic rice price has kept growing over the years. 
With all of this, Indonesia is safe from relative price volatility if it happens in the international markets. But if the price is stable, like for the last 13 years, uh, sorry, for the last uh, uh, 10 years, the Indonesians are suffering from these, from these uh, price increases in the domestic market. This, which leads to a real scenario of real food items. We have a monthly food, food price index in Indonesia where we just compare food prices in Jakarta to the neighboring countries, including also Australia. And quite often, Indonesia is the most expensive in real terms. For food, rice, for example, Indonesia is more expensive than Singapore, Malaysia, or Thailand. Apples and salt, the same. Beef is more expensive in Thailand, but still in, in Indonesia, it's still uh, comparatively expensive. Now, we just look at these five items, and then we look at a family of five. You have a father, adult, male, between 30 and 50. The mother, we have two, three children, two girls, one boy. We take this as a standard kind of family. And with the normal consumption rates per head, per day, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, you end up calculating that the whole family would spend just on these five items 1.8 million rupiah per month. That is only a little bit more than $100, but a lot of people don't have $100 per month in Indonesia. In fact, millions and millions don't have that amount of money. So that's why, in the end, beef consumption in the country is extremely low. You have, the numbers are always a problem in Indonesia, but uh, according to this, 1.9 kilo of beef consumption in 2016. In comparison to Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines, this is extremely low. And this is not for some cultural and traditional reasons. This is because it's way too expensive to buy beef in the country. And the result, you see the dark red areas, is these areas where a lot of children are stunted because they don't get the nutrition that they actually need. 37% of all Indonesian children under five are stunted. That's a scandal, and that's not necessary with global markets supplying excellent food. What Australia does in its SEPA negotiations with Indonesia is extremely helpful. It's saying you need to open up the markets. We have excellent produce here. We want to export to, Indone to Indonesia. That's a good move. The pressure needs to be there. So we, we really support this. Um, we have the same on the WTO. The WTO, US and New Zealand have sued uh, Indonesia. They have won. Indonesia appealed. Indonesia lost again. It basically means the food law has to be changed. The discrimination against foreign producers cannot be upheld. This still has to happen, but um, this is definitely uh, positive pressure, not because of the exporters. What we care about is the millions of, Indonesia, of Indonesians who cannot afford their domestic food. So that's um, what we are working on in our center. We are saying the farmers are amongst the poorest. They never benefited from the self-sufficiency policy. We produce research papers. I'm very happy to share with you if you are interested. We do a lot of advocacy. We do a coalition with consumer advocates, with nutrition experts, with market vendors, and we run online courses on food trade issues. Thank you very much.